tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by BetterHelp. So how does your family handle the holidays, folks? Is it a full-fledged gift fest with all the bells and whistles, or do you keep it low-key and focus on spending time together? However you handle the holidays, you should always remember to give a little to yourself. And this time of year is a great time to do that. So whether it's by starting therapy, going easier on yourself, or getting some well-deserved rest, remember who really needs some love this holiday season. That's you, folks. In the season of giving, give yourself what you need with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash chilling today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp. H-E-L-P dot com slash chilling. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by Fume. You know, dropping a bad habit and kicking it cold turkey are not the same thing, folks. Cold turkey is great on a sandwich, but abruptly depriving yourself of something is no picnic at all. Consider this. Fume, spelled F-U-M, is designed to help you replace your bad habit with a harmless one. It uses no vapor, no electronics, no chemicals, only natural delicious flavors packed into an award-winning device designed to help you succeed. Stopping is something we all put off because it's hard, but switching to Fume is easy, enjoyable, even fun. Fume has served over 150,000 customers and has thousands of success stories, and there's no reason that can't be you. Join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the journey pack today. Head to tryfume.com and use code CHILLING to save 10% off when you get the journey pack today. That's tryfum.com and use code word CHILLING to save an additional 10% off your order today. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with two audio adaptations of frightening fiction about malicious myths and disappearing darlings. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and tonight I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Micah Edwards are voice talents Justin Reynolds, Kevin Barbari, and Melissa Medina. Now, get your ticket ready, take your seat in our theater of the minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first tale this evening is written by Micah Edwards and is performed by Justin Reynolds. In it, a young man finally heeds his family's warning, but will it be in time? 
Now, without further ado, I present to you The Hunger of Evota Falls. Schedule, boss. I fix him with have him all dressed up by late evening. What you think of the matter? What do I think? I'll tell you. Lambs. Nothing but a bunch of lambs, Francis. Led astray from the herd. Right for any man willing to take the picking. Well, you said it there. Thought of supper's making me rather peck or something. Rattle <laughs> On your right. I see him. You know, if the devil looks you right in the eye, you look right back at him. <laughs> Come on, let's head back down. <laughs> we have guests. <laughs> Maybe Delia has something heating on the stove. Ackerman reflected was that they never went away. They just changed into other problems, sometimes smaller, sometimes larger, but never gone. Problems fed on each other just like everything else. Plenty of times he's seen a whole bunch of little problems getting eaten up by a really big tough one. Sometimes it even seemed like that might be a benefit. Sure, the big problem was huge and dangerous, even deadly. But it threatened everyone. The whole community could work together to take it down. Thing is, as soon as that happened, a hundred new smaller problems would show up to feast. In no time at all, everything would be right back where it started. Take this town, the Boda Falls. It had been a good town once, or at least a good idea. The railroad needed a resupply stop. A place to store things in the middle of the long trip through the desert. Some thought the workers might pay for a little entertainment in the off hours. So then there was a saloon. That started doing well. And pretty soon came the general store. And the wash house. And the church. Next thing anyone knew, Evota Falls was a real town. The river had been the key though. It was nothing but a big muddy ribbon with water that had to be boiled twice to get rid of the taste. But it grew plants all along its banks and made the desert just tolerable enough for life. At least it had. Until that canal had been dug about 40 miles upstream and diverted the water. The falls were nothing but a big red cliff overlooking a dry riverbed now. The plants were dead. And a vote of falls was dying. That had been the big problem. All of the little ones got chewed right up by that. Some folks packed up and left, but most of them, the ranchers, store owners, the ones who really believed in the place, well, they were stuck. They'd sunk their money into the town, and they were well and truly sunk along with it. The preacher swore that the Lord would provide, of course. While they were waiting for that to happen, Everyone left in the town kind of figured that they were going to have to make do for themselves. They had to come up with something to kill this problem before it killed them. And so, eventually, they invented the curdler. It hadn't been a quick decision. There had been a lot of hand-wringing and soul-searching and general lamentations. 
But day by day, as the dust got thicker and the cattle got leaner, folks started to come around. The dead man in the saloon was what finally did it. The barman Cork found him slumped back against the wall at the end of the night, bottle tipped over in front of him. When Cork went to kick him out though, the man was the same temperature as the wall he was leaning against. He had been dead for hours. He was just some rail worker. No one knew his name or where he was from. He had no ID on him. All anyone did know was that he was a sight fatter than anyone else in town. Even then, no one wanted to make the first move. It had been the butcher, Ackerman, who had stepped in, pushing his way through the murmuring crowd. He'd hefted the body up over his shoulder like a side of beef, and with a challenging glare, he dared any member of the crowd to meet his eye. None of them had. They moved aside as he headed for the door. I'll share. No one said anything at all. The preacher caught sight of him out in the street. He'd heard the talk. He knew how desperate things were getting. <laughs> the chat shot's this way. Surely you're looking for a place to bury that man. God has provided, Father. Be awful rude of us to dump his gift in a hole in the ground. <laughs> you know this isn't right. Not a lot around here that seems to be these days. What's one more? At least we can make this one wrong in our favor. I won't let you do this. Ackerman turned slowly to face the preacher. His eyes burned with fury and resentment. He bared his teeth in a mockery of a smile. <laughs> I'd like to see you stop me. To his surprise, the preacher tried. He grabbed the dead man's ankles and attempted to haul him off Ackerman's shoulder. Ackerman pulled back, though, yanking the preacher off balance and... Well, maybe it was an accident. Maybe it wasn't. Either way, there was a scuffle and a tumble and a thump. And then the preacher was lying at the foot of the horse trough, head half caved in and blood gushing into the street. Ackerman looked around at the crowd. They stared back at him. Tension ran its nervous fingers along everyone's spine. They all knew that whatever happened next would determine the course of the town. They were all afraid to be the one to take action. <laughs> With a grunt, Ackerman hauled the preacher's body up from the ground and folded him across his other shoulder. He did not say a word as he walked off. His heavy burdens made his steps slow and deliberate. Anyone could have said anything. No one did, and so the die was cast. wasn't the solution to Vodafone's starvation problem, of course. Two bodies, especially one that spares the preacher, would only go so far. But the railroad brought new bodies every single day. Naturally, most of them were just passing through. That only made it easier. Such folks were often unmoored, wandering without family or friends to worry about them. There was no one to notice or care if they went missing. Ackerman was wary of killing the goose that laid the golden eggs. He kept the people of Avoda Falls from getting too greedy and taking too many travelers in too short a time frame. <laughs> it was hard sometimes, especially when the children were whining for food and some plump out-of-towner was sitting right there. <laughs> it wouldn't do to get caught, though. They'd all be hanged if the outside world discovered how they'd been getting by. Then Ackerman came up with the curdler. Make up a murderous monster, he reasoned, and you get monster hunters looking for it. Put a bounty on its head and you'd attract greedy men. Men prone to violence. The kind of men where nobody would bat an eye if they went missing. They might even consider it a blessing. Ackerman tested the waters cautiously at first. He tried it out on a couple of men he met in a bar two cities away. A night of buying drinks and a bottle for the train ride was all it took to convince them to come along. He talked up the curdler the whole way, 
Describing its fearsome size, its terrible claws, the way it could scoop up a cow as easy as a man could pick up a mule and baby. In short, he made it sound like a proper tall tale. He didn't want the man actually worried about whatever they might run into. The curdler was a yokel's retelling of a mountain lion half glimpsed. Dangerous enough to be worth the sport, but nothing truly to concern a couple of rough and ready men. The booze he was buying them was real enough, and Ackerman promised more when the job was done. So they came along willingly enough. They followed him right out into the ambush he'd prepared, and they were riddled with half a dozen bullets apiece before their guns ever cleared leather. Once the bullets were picked out and the meat was dressed, the town ate well again for a few days. Ackerman was cheered by how well it had gone. The hunters had been so convinced that he was just a scared hick that they'd never considered him a threat. They'd been taken totally unawares when the townsfolk shot them down. And since absolutely no one knew that they'd come here, there was no chance that anyone would come looking. The next time Ackerman went out to talk up the curdler, he brought back a group of five eager would-be hunters. The time after that it was eight. Someone came up with the bright idea of making flyers like wanted posters. And after that, the hunters just started showing up on their own. They were always the same type. Loners. Drifters. The kind who'd pull up stakes to run to a new town for a chance to strike a rich. Ackerman knew that they'd never be missed. He never felt a drop of guilt preying on them either. They would have done it to him in an instant if the tables were turned. The trickle of hunters became a small but steady stream and suddenly the town found itself with a new and surprising problem. Far from having too little food, they now had too much. Ackerman Slaughterhouse had never been intended for more than a few cows at a time. With the hunters coming in almost every single day, he simply couldn't process the meat fast enough. Even with the help, there was only so much room to work. He needed more space. In Voda Falls had never been a large town. Although there were a number of abandoned buildings these days, most were homesteads whose interior rooms were entirely too small for the work that needed to be done. In fact, as Ackerman looked around the town, he realized that there was only one building with the space necessary to set up a full-scale shop. The church. A more religious man might have had an issue with turning a house of worship into an abattoir, particularly concerning the nature of the meat. Then again, that hypothetical religious man might have told himself that it was a providence how everything fit together. Just when the town was in its darkest hour, the Lord had sacrificed his own servant and given his people a place to pursue their own salvation. A religious man might have decided that God had provided after all. Ackerman, an avowed atheist, had always found it best to avoid men of that particular sort of religious conviction. They could twist anything to prove that they were doing good. He was merely doing what was needed. There was little resistance. The townsfolk having gone so far did not balk at his newest desecration. And so in a matter of days, the church was gutted and repurposed, changed from a house to cleanse men's souls to a hall to flinch their bodies. The statuary was packed away. The pulpit was dismantled. The pews were taken apart and remade into long tables. The solid wood planks that had supported the town through many a sermon were soon scored by knives and stained a deep, irredeemable red. The people of Avoda Falls came to work their shifts. There was no discussion, no official roster. There were simply people there when there was work to be done. Everyone took their turn. Slowly, Ackerman found the work taken away from him. He would arrive at the church to find the bodies already separated, the awful discarded, the boiled bones being ground into meal. People nodded when he arrived, but did not step aside for him to take their place. He was in charge now. Everyone knew it. One Sunday, one of the men greeted him with, Hello, Reverend. Absolutely not! Ackerman's voice rang out over the clamor of the charnel house. Knives skittered against bone. 
Wheels ground to a halt. Everyone turned to look. We did this. For good or ill, this is our doing. We will live or die here by our own deeds. Our own words. Our own hands. This is the work of men, not gods. If you want to give away the credit, or the blame, I won't presume to say which. You can leave my name out of it. He turned on his heel and walked out without giving the man a chance to respond. No one ever addressed it. But a few days later when someone called him mayor, Ackerman didn't object. If they needed a title to set a man apart, then so be it. This is one he could accept. Though the physical work may have been shifted to others, Ackerman found himself far from idle. Now that starvation was no longer imminent, the thousand problems that came along with society began to reassert themselves, along with some new ones that were unique to the town's situation. For example, there was the matter of temporary housing. All of the folks who'd come to hunt the curler needed some place to stay while they were in town. Never mind that they all ended up at the church before the first night was through. They didn't know how it was going to go down, and they would hardly do to tip them off to it. So they had to have rooms with beds, and they had to be fed. If they'd come in on the early train, then they had to be discouraged from getting too inquisitive and wandering around the town too. Most of them were far more likely to be drawn to the saloon than to the church, but it never hurt to take caution. At first, Ackerman just had them stay with folks around town, or in empty houses. It was inconvenient having them spread all about though, and folks had a bad habit of laying claim to the possession of hunters who'd been quartered in their houses. He could see how things would be a lot smoother with the hunters all in one place. Only problem was that again, no building was big enough. A rooming house would be just the thing Ackerman thought. If only they had one, of course. He expected it would be difficult to do, but when the mayor spoke, things happened. Not two weeks after he brought up the idea, the town had one built. With a fresh coat of paint on the outside and some careful placement on the inside, it was impossible to tell it had been cobbled together from the boards of three other houses. It had beds to sleep twenty in a common room big enough to feed the same, as long as they didn't mind cramming in a bit. Delia took over running the inn as soon as it was built. With her serving food and cork slinging drinks down at the saloon, most of the hunters were half drunk and half asleep by the time the nightly curdler hunt came along. Many of them had their eyes closed when their guide stuck a knife into their throats. That suited Ackerman just fine. The last thing he wanted was a fair fight. The boarding house took care of the hunters coming into town, but that still left Ackerman with an equally large problem. How to keep the reins on the folks already here? Everyone had been in accordance when survival was on the line for certain, and most of them understood that there was no one crossing the line they'd crossed. But there were some who, once their bellies were full and the money from the vigilante's pockets had transferred to their own, started to think that maybe it was time to move on from Avoda Falls. Ackerman couldn't allow this. Here in a tight-knit community that all kept each other honest, if folks started wandering off back into the world though, where people didn't understand the necessities life could demand, well, they might say anything then. It would only take one person looking to expunge their guilt to bring a whole heap of new trouble down on an Avoda Falls. When the first grumble of the discontent started to make their way around town, Ackerman addressed it head on. He called out the perpetrators, a family by the name of Soulfield, to let it be known that leaving was not an option. That wasn't any more than a bandage over a gut shot, of course, but at least it was something. It kept the complainers from getting on the 1235 train and riding right out of town in full view of everyone. If they'd done that, there'd have been nothing Ackerman could have done to stop them. Too many direct witnesses, with the repercussions to themselves too far away. There would have been an outcry if he'd laid hands on them at noon. The Soulfields weren't certain of that, though. They'd been there when Ackerman had fought the preacher. They'd worked their shifts in the Red Church. They knew they were turning against the town and they were afraid to face Ackerman directly. They packed up quietly in the night and tried to sneak out of town on the 614 morning train. When they stepped onto the train platform in the thin dawn light, Ackerman was waiting for them. 
He detached himself from the thick wooden support where he had been waiting and walked toward the huddled trio, silent as a ghost. Kaz Soulfield never saw him coming. His eyes were fixed up the track scanning for the arriving train when Ackerman slipped up behind him, kicked his legs out from under him and snapped his neck. His wife Julia screamed, but Ackerman pushed her onto the tracks and shot her in the back as she stumbled. Her blood coated the rails and sank into the sand, but Ackerman didn't worry about it. It would be cleared away and covered as soon as the train arrived. Their son Luke stared wide-eyed, too shocked to move. Ackerman took the young teen by the shoulders and gently led him away from the platform. Come on, son. None of this was your fault. Let's get you back home. As they stepped off the platform, Ackerman slashed the boy's neck. The blood fountain hard, falling in the crimson fan on the desert scrub. Ackerman kicked more sand over it, pleased with his work. Not a drop had spilled on the difficult to clean boards. He dragged the bodies away piling them into a small wooden cart he had stashed nearby a week ago. Ackerman had been waiting on the train platform every morning since he'd heard the Soulfields complain. From the moment the words had left their lips, this end had been inevitable. The church was silent at this time of the day. The people of Avoda Falls were asleep after the slaughter of the previous night. Knowing that lack as not, they'd be doing it again under the evening's moon. Ackerman hauled his grim trophies inside, barred the door behind him, and set to work. Ackerman had been a butcher long before the title of mayor had been thrust upon him. The hooks and knives were familiar in his hands. He stripped skin from flesh, drained blood, and separated organs with ease and long practice. By the time the town was awake, the soul fields were nothing more than meat on the pile. People noticed their absence, of course. Ackerman listened for the whispers he knew would be coming. He was ready with his answer. The cardler took him. He held the questioner's gaze when he said it. Every one of them dropped their eyes. They knew what he meant. They knew they as a town were responsible for this too. They had failed to look after their own. The curdler had been forced to step in. There had been one or two others since that Ackerman had to deal with. Hobson had tried to sneak off into the desert, and young Jeffrey started using drinking as an excuse for violence. The curdler came for each of them. By the time anyone noticed their absence, the church door was unbarred and Ackerman's hands were clean. He knew it couldn't last forever. One of the hunters would get away, or one of the townsfolk would finally slip his grasp. In the end, the curdler came for everyone. But until that day, he was mayor of Mboda Falls, a little desert town that was surviving in spite of all odds. In fact, they were doing so well that he was thinking about setting up an export business for their excess meat. <laughs> they had more than they knew what to do with these days. And seeing his community thrive when it should have died, that feeling justified every sacrifice. So ugly, don't you know? Face like a donkey sitting in the stove. Smelling of whiskey and a cheap cigar. Fell off my horse looking up at the stars. Off to the brothel for a bath and a whore. A bastard like me couldn't ask for more. Oh now, oh, oh, oh now, slow down. Slow down. Roger, Roger. Ooh, damn. Oh, yeah, down I go. <laughs> Shut up, apples! You stupid horse. 
Like a donkey sitting in the snow. Well, no whiskey, uh, cheese cigar. What was that? <clears throat> Who's there? Who's there? Show yourself, you son of a bitch! This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by BetterHelp. It's the season of giving, folks. So how does your family handle the holidays? In a perfect world, it would be mostly about spending time together. In our world, though, it's largely about wallet-busting, high-ticket acquisitions for the kids, which they immediately run off with and leave you with the recycling. We're all happy they're having fun, but don't we? Deserve some love, too? Sure we do. And the holidays are a great time to get it. A well-deserved rest, a resolution to be easier on ourselves, and a personal dedicated therapist from BetterHelp Online Therapy. With all the stress of the holidays and another year nearly in the books, there's no better gift you can give yourself. Therapy can help you sort out your hectic thoughts and anxieties, enjoy the moment, and plan the future. Getting started is easy. Just visit BetterHelp.com slash chilling, fill out their questionnaire, and you'll have a ready and willing therapist in 48 hours. You'll have virtual appointments weekly and can text anytime in between. It's flexible, convenient, and this part's refreshing, affordable. Yes, you heard that right. Much, much cheaper than traditional therapy. That's why I love this service. Time-tested, clinically proven treatment with a modern-day delivery system. Since it's all done online and over the phone, you can skip the travel, the formalities, and all the expenses of an office. Remote therapy with better help makes the help you need more accessible than ever. I'm sure there'll be plenty of happy faces around the tree this year, folks until they run upstairs anyway. But do something special for yourself too. Trust me, you deserve it. In the season of giving, give yourself what you need with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash chilling today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash chilling. Thanks for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors. I hope you enjoyed The Hunger of Evota Falls, as written by Micah Edwards and performed by Justin Reynolds. Justin Reynolds has an intense adoration for music. He loves all the artistic and creative endeavors of life, from the beautiful to the ugly. Our second tale of the evening is written by Micah Edwards and is performed by Kevin Barberi and Melissa Medina. In it, we are brought to a town during one of the hardest times of the year, the time of the disappearing season. Now, without further ado, I present to you, Tree Tops. Nearly half a million children are reported missing each year in the United States, averaged out across all of the cities, towns, and the like. That comes out to about four missing kids per populated area per year. Fortunately, all but a tiny handful 
about 12,000, or one for every nine towns, turn up unharmed, and only a hundredth of a percent, or about one kid every 2,160 towns, is found murdered. Averages are great for breaking big statistics down into numbers that are easier to understand, but obviously nothing really works that way. More kids go missing in Texas than in the other states, for example, while almost none go missing in South Dakota. More children are found safely in New York than almost anywhere else. And in the small town of Dorton Bluffs, not one missing child has ever been found alive. They lose their four per year pretty regularly. There's almost never been a year where at least two didn't disappear. 2015 was particularly bad, and 10 kids went missing. The police records for the town only go back to 1996, when a fire burned down the station one night. But the memories of the families there go back a lot longer. Children who vanish in Dorton Bluffs are rarely seen again. Those who are discovered, for the most part, the families wish they hadn't been. Statistical improbabilities happen, of course. However, to the eyes of Felix Freeman, an investigator in the FBI's Child Abduction and Serial Killer Unit, these disappearances had all of the hallmarks of an uncaught killer. The victims were all teenagers or younger, with most being between 12 and 16. The town was in a remote geographic area with plenty of unoccupied land, and most interestingly, they seemed to happen around the same two times each year, right at the beginning of both spring and fall. Even in the years where more children went missing, they disappeared in two small clusters around those dates. This reeked of ritual to Felix. After months of badgering his superiors, he wrangled the funding for an exploratory trip to the region. To his mind, it was an open and shut case. The question was not whether the abductions were happening. That, he felt, was entirely certain. All he needed was proof of the culprit. Whoever was behind this was responsible for hundreds of disappearances, making him the most prolific serial killer ever found. If, of course, Felix could find him. He was positive he could. Felix had had the profile built long before he had ever submitted his request for funding. He was looking for a man, likely in his 70s at this point, someone born and raised in Dorton Bluffs but who had not been popular as a teen. He was an only child or a significantly younger sibling, 10 years or more. His mother had died when he was no more than five years old. He had probably never married and almost certainly never had any children. His schooling had stopped at high school. He did not travel. He was probably a farmer. Felix had requested funding for two weeks worth of travel, but in all honesty, he expected it to take only three days. One to search through the town census and land records to determine his suspect, one to convince a local judge to issue a warrant, and one to unearth the trophies that the man had doubtless kept from each of his killings. If Dorton Bluffs had bothered to digitize any of their records, he could probably have found a name for his suspect and gotten a warrant before ever setting foot in the town. Then again, if they were the sort of place inclined to modernize, they would never have had a serial killer like this in their midst in the first place. His intent had been to keep a low profile. It was very likely that the killer kept an eye on any activity in town, though probably from a distance. His victims were taken too regularly to simply be crimes of convenience, which meant that he had to observe and plan. A stranger in town would already be something of note, one who was blatantly asking questions designed to find someone matching the killer's description would tip him off immediately. When Felix walked into the courthouse and asked to see the archivist, though, the woman at the counter cast a jaded eye over him. Mm, here to find out about the missing kids? Felix was completely taken aback. I... what do you mean? It's the start of disappearing season. That's when your sort usually turns up wanting to go through the records. I can't, uh, you have a name for it? The woman shrugged. Hmm, of course we do. Town's got a situation like ours, it's bound to get a name. And what, you just let it happen? What do you want us to do about it? Felix was baffled by her unconcern. <sighs> Anything. Catch the guy. Stop whoever's preying on the kids in your town. <sighs> Look, there's no guy, mister. The kids who vanish, they were never happy here. Not a whole lot to offer a certain kind of person out here. We don't have big malls and fancy theaters and high-tech living. I and mean, even Walmart's more than an hour away. So you're saying that they just run away? Felix stared at her in disbelief. 
Every single year, something like a half dozen kids just pick up and start walking, and not one of them ever comes back. It's a, uh, what do they call it now? A meme. It lives in their heads, you know? Things aren't going so well at home, they start thinking about how Jim or Mark or Andrew was talking last year about something similar, and about how they took a hike. They think about how it must have worked out and how their friend's probably living it up in the big city right now. They picture themselves in a big apartment, flashing cash around, and just doing all the things a small town just won't let you do. And that's what you think has happened? (laughs) No, I've seen the city. I think they're all crammed into tiny rat hole apartments with a couple of roommates working some minimum wage job that barely lets them survive. But the kind of person who runs away from here to prove that they know better They can't come back with their tail tucked between their legs, and they give this town a big middle finger and said they could do better, and they can't take the shame of admitting they were wrong. They must have been, though. If any of them had made it, you can bet they'd have been right back through here, waving that money around to show us all what we were missing. And it never occurred to you that you might be wrong? That something might have been happening to these kids and you could have helped them if only you'd looked? Someone like you comes by every so often, saying something pretty much like that. They dig into it for a few days and then wander off. None of them have ever stopped back by to let me know what they've learned. I'm guessing you won't either. And I'm guessing it's for the same reason those kids never came back. Too embarrassed to admit you were the one who was wrong. Felix shook his head. (sighs) I suppose we'll see. Downstairs... The archivist brought Felix the records he requested without comment, but something in his body language gave Felix the impression that he felt the same as the lady at the front desk. Perhaps it was the way he dropped off the stack of books, or the manner in which he turned away immediately afterward. It may have simply been his total lack of curiosity about why Felix wanted the documents. Whatever the cause, Felix was sure that the archivist expected him to look into the matter, conclude that for decades children had simply been wandering off and slink back to D.C., For a moment, Felix even wondered if he might be correct. He had thought that it was strange that he was the first one to notice the pattern here. And if it turned out that others had investigated and found nothing, then perhaps he really was barking up the wrong tree. He shook the thought off. The evidence was too strong. This sort of thing didn't happen anywhere else in America. It was only Dorton Bluffs. Something was going on here, even if the people in town didn't want to believe it. And who could blame them? Who would want to believe that the worst serial killer ever found had been operating nearby for decades? People in places like Dorton Bluffs like to describe their towns as peaceful or calm or even sleepy. They didn't want to consider the idea that horrific murders had been occurring multiple times a year for their entire lives. It would upend their entire worldview of their quiet community. It would make them question their own status as good people having done nothing about it. Felix didn't blame them, not really. It was possible to be too close to something to see how screwed up it was. Most of them had grown up with this acceptance of the biannual disappearances being the way things were. Anything could seem normal if you were raised to expect it. The land records gave Felix a listing of who lived on the outskirts of the community. He was able to cross off quite a few immediately due to the title being in multiple people's names as he was looking for a lifetime loner. The census narrowed it down still further, providing him with ages and identifying who had siblings, partners, and families. At the end of the day, Felix was left with a list of four good suspects. It wasn't quite the absolute certainty he'd told himself he would have on day one, but it was close. A few questions around town tomorrow would reveal which one it was he was sure. Even if folks said that nothing was going on, people always had opinions on who the weird ones were especially in a small town like this. As he was walking back to the hotel, he was nearly knocked over by a crowd of laughing children scampering by him along the sidewalk. He watched them scatter down alleys and behind buildings, their noise quieting as they separated. Up ahead, a young girl with her eyes closed was being spun in circles by a boy only slightly older who was chanting, Standing in the forest, still as a tree Hiding up high where nobody can see Snatching up a baby, quick as can be Treetops, treetops, don't eat me When he finished the rhyme, her eyes popped open and she ran off down the street in pursuit of the others, laughing as she staggered back and forth from the dizziness. Felix heard shrieks of glee and triumph from behind him as she found one after another of her hidden friends. He smiled and continued on his way. 
It was good to see that no matter what else was going on in the town, children were the same everywhere. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by Fume. Going cold turkey is one heck of a way to kick a habit, folks. You got all the right intentions, believe me, but if you'll hear me out for a minute before you commence torturing yourself, literally, I think it might do you some good. And no, it's not some new age remedy or self-hypnosis nonsense. It's real. It's simple. And not for nothing, it's fun. It's called Fume. That's spelled F-U-M, folks. It's an award-winning flavored air device designed to make kicking the habit a little easier. It uses no vapor, has no electronics, and contains no harmful chemicals, just natural, delicious flavors. See, not every aspect of your bad habit is actually bad. There's nothing wrong with keeping your hands busy and enjoying a little flavor in your life. With Fume, you're free to have all that. So rather than stewing in your own juices all day, clawing your flesh off in agonized deprivation, you've got a little something to lean on. Get it? I'll put it simply. Bad habits are bad, but Fume is good. It's fun to use, too. It feels good in my hand, and I love fidgeting with it. It has movable parts and magnets to mess with, which is good for stress. Yeah, way better than clawing your own flesh off, in my opinion. I also love the taste of it. It's fresh and natural, but surprisingly flavorful. Beautifully built, too. Weighted perfectly. Real wood. Really nice. I could really get used to this thing, believe me. And hey, it's a habit I can feel good about. So can you. Stopping is something we all put off because it's hard. But switching to fume is easy, enjoyable, and even fun. Fume has served over 150,000 customers and has thousands of success stories, and there's no reason that can't be you. Join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the journey pack today. Head to tryfume.com and use code word shelling to save 10% off when you get the journey pack today. That's tryfum.com. And use code word CHILLING to save an additional 10% off your order today. Thanks for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors. The next morning, Felix went to a nearby diner in hopes of finding some locals to engage in casual conversation at the dining counter. He thought he might pose as a land developer looking to buy one of the farms on the edge of town see if he could draw out some thoughts on the men who owned the places. To his surprise, his attempts immediately ran into the same shrewd awareness he had encountered at the courthouse. Hi, I'm new in town. Just been taking a bit of a look around. I was thinking I might buy a piece of land around here. Do you know anything about, uh... He consulted a notebook for the look of things, though he knew the names and addresses of each man he wanted to ask about. John Simmons, out on County Road 115? The man next to him at the counter fixed him with a look. You're looking to bother him about the runaways? Felix acted confused while trying to recover. Sorry, the what? Did he have runaways on his farm? The man snorted. <laughs> Mister, you may think I'm stupid, but I don't think I'm stupid. If you want an answer to the question you asked, no, John won't sell. If you want to talk about what you were going to spend 20 minutes hunting around at instead, we can skip to that part if you like. So, you're aware of the disappearances? If you want to call them that. Folks disappear off to the big city every day. It's got a lot to offer a certain type of person. But these are kids! Farm kids, mainly. Been doing hard manual labor since they were old enough to lift a pail. Working a sandwich shop sounds to some of them like it might be a nice break. Did you know that they only vanish at certain times of the year? It's only ever at the start of spring and fall. When did you want them to go? In summer, when it's so hot even the flies go lie down in the shade? Oh, or in winter, with snow drifting up past a grown man's shoulders? Of course they go in the nice times of the year. The man turned back to his coffee. Look, you don't have to listen to me. Go down to the high school. That's the kids there. Tommy Finch left last year. Everyone knew him. If they think different from me, they'll let you know. 
Felix looked around the diner. No one was even pretending not to have been listening. He could tell by their expressions that they were unlikely to give him any other answer than the one he'd just gotten. He sighed and ordered breakfast. The rest of the day was no more fruitful. He tried a few different cover stories at other locations, but met with the same result everywhere. Everyone called him on his bluffs immediately, and although they were perfectly willing to talk to him, every single person gave him the same answer. The kids had just left on their own. Year after year, in defiance of all probability, they had gone looking for a better life in the big city and had never come back. As the afternoon wore on, Felix found himself running low on ideas. He couldn't bring a judge four possibilities and ask for a warrant on all of their properties just to find out which one it was. He was tempted to just pick the most likely and hope, but if he guessed wrong, then the murders would continue, and on a more personal level, his credibility and career would take a serious hit. Against his better judgment, Felix headed over to the high school as it was letting out for the day. He tried to figure out a reason for being there that wouldn't sound creepy. After a few rejected ideas, he decided to just bite the bullet and go with the truth. I'm looking into the yearly disappearances of kids. I know Tommy Finch was one of them last year and he went here. Any of you willing to talk about it? Most of the teens streamed past him without stopping. A few did him the courtesy of shaking their heads to at least show that they'd hurt him, but the majority didn't even make eye contact. Just as Felix was giving up, he caught one boy's attention. Hey, you looking for Tommy? The boy was on the younger side for high school, maybe 14 or 15. Four other teens had stopped with him. All were eyeing Felix curiously, waiting on his response. Felix didn't want to give the group false hope by implying that Tommy might still be alive, but he also didn't want to lose the first students who'd been willing to talk to him. He chose his words carefully. I'm looking into the disappearances, including his, yeah. I think it's likely that there'll be some more soon. I'm hoping to stop them. Then you're looking for treetops. So you don't think that the kids are simply running away? The boy shook his head. The gesture was echoed by his friends. No, they get out of line and treetops takes them. Who's treetops? Not who, what? Up in the forest north of town. That's where they take the offerings. That's where treetops is. Felix was elated. Only one of the farms on his list was up that way. Is it Darren Olson? Is that who takes them? The boy shook his head. Treetops isn't a person. It doesn't matter who takes them. You could arrest anyone in this town and someone else would do it. Treetops is a cult? The idea took Felix's breath away with its enormity. It seemed impossible to believe that an entire town could be complicit in such a thing, but it fit with everything he'd seen so far. In fact, it made significantly more sense than anything else. Felix's heartbeat was suddenly loud in his ears as he considered all of the people he'd spoken to over the last two days. By now, everyone in town must know why he was there. He wasn't safe. He had to leave. The boy's voice cut through his burgeoning panic. I can show you where they take them. Felix hesitated, considering. Spending any more time here was a risk. On the other hand, fleeing empty-handed because a teenager had fed him a story about the entire town being a death cult wasn't going to play well with his superiors. It all made sense, but Felix had no proof. If the boy could show him something in the woods, he could bring back concrete proof instead of just a bad feeling. All right. Suddenly, it occurred to Felix that going to the woods outnumbered four to one might be a mistake. But just you. I'm not getting in your car alone, man. Me and Carl. Neither boy came up past Felix's chin, and he had his gun besides. All right, let's go now before it gets dark. Paved roads gave way to dirt roads, which quickly led to a rutted, weed-covered path closed off by a chain with a no-trespassing sign hanging from it. Carl got out of the car to unhook the chain. Devon, which Felix had learned was the first boy's name, leaned up from the back seat. We're going to go down here about a quarter mile. Go slow, because some of these ruts will rip the bottom right off your car if you're not careful. The road's going to end in a little clearing, and then we'll walk from there. Felix eyed the tree line. How long a walk? Half an hour, maybe. Less if you've got a good pace. Plenty of time to get in and back out while it's still light. The path ended in a space just big enough to turn a car around, as Devin had said. Felix climbed out of the car and followed the two boys into the woods. They walked with purpose, which he took to be a good sign. The idea that this was a prank, or worse, was still at the front of his mind. So how long has Treetops been going on? Longer than anyone here. What happens to people who don't join? Treetops happens to them. 
Aren't you worried about them finding out that you've told me all of this? Nah, treetops will take care of that. Abruptly, the two boys sprinted off in different directions. Felix cursed and grabbed for his gun as he took off after Carl, who seemed to be slightly slower. The teen's smaller size was an advantage in the woods, however, and Felix rapidly lost sight of him as he vanished into the trees. Felix stopped, caught his breath, and assessed the situation. He didn't know precisely where he was, but he knew roughly which direction they'd come from and how long they'd walked. Even if he missed the car, he was bound to come across the road, and he could find his way back from there. He began walking back in the direction of the car. After a few feet, Felix heard a faint, intermittent rustling from somewhere behind him. He kept walking as if he'd heard nothing, but focused his attention and waited for the sound to repeat. A few steps later, it came again. It was a gentle rustling of the underbrush, the sort that might have been caused by an animal or even the wind. It was coming from only a short way behind him, though, and it seemed to be moving in his direction. Felix continued onward until he heard the noise once more, then whipped around, gun drawn. He expected to see the scared faces of one or both of the teens, or at least their backs as they ran from him, but was surprised to see nothing behind him but vines and trees. One of the trunks suddenly moved, sweeping toward him in a huge, ground-eating step. It traveled through the air with barely a whisper and landed with nothing more than a slight rustle of the brush beneath it. Felix looked up in disbelief to see a titanic, gangly hand descending for him. Each gnarled finger was as long as his body, and the arm beyond them was the size of an oak. It moved with terrifying swiftness and almost total silence. Felix fired his gun directly into the onrushing palm, but it had no more effect than throwing a pebble against a train. He ducked and ran as the fingers swiped overhead, clenching into a fist just where he had been standing. Roots, vines, and branches clutched at Felix as he ran. The forest itself seemed determined to stop him, though it offered no such impediment to the gigantic thing at his heels. Over and over again, he heard the frightening whisper of its footfalls, felt the threatening breeze of its grasp. He dodged back and forth, scoring his face and arms with a thousand small cuts, desperately fleeing for safety. Sunlight glinted on metal, and Felix recognized his rental car. He was almost back to the clearing. He put on a final burst of speed and tore from the trees, sprinting for the car. He grabbed the door handle, only to find it locked. As he grabbed for the key in his pocket, fingers as hard as stone wrapped around him and lifted him effortlessly from the ground. Felix shrieked as he was carried up into the trees, the car vanishing beneath him. He struggled and kicked, but the grip around his body was implacable. Enormous steps carried him swiftly back into the forest, the tops of the trees brushing rapidly by his trapped body. The green of the pine needles surrounding him was suddenly broken by swaths of white. In horror, Felix realized that the upper branches were decorated with thousands of bones, rib cages, and hip bones, and skulls. The grisly ornaments stretched as far as he could see in any direction, a gruesome aerial graveyard. Felix opened his mouth to scream again. The hand holding him tightened only once. There was a sudden, brutal crunch. After that was silence, except for a quiet, steady dripping. He almost made it out. He and Devon were back at the clearing, hiding behind a small earthen hill on the far side. Good thing for us he did it, Devon shrugged. You think he deserved it? Could be. You think any of us deserve it? Well, they picked the ones who act out. Sure, if you believe that. You think you've been good enough that they couldn't find a reason to feed you to treetops? Better him than us. It was always a good year when someone came from the outside. Treetops was happy to eat strangers, and they could spare their own. I hope you enjoyed Tree Tops, as written by Micah Edwards and performed by Kevin Barberi and Melissa Medina. Micah Edwards resides in Richmond, Virginia, the world's premier home of authors named Micah Edwards. His works run the gamut from superhero noir, as seen in the Experiment series, to non-fiction conversational retellings of the Bible. He has rewritten horror stories for children and fairy tales for adults. More information and more stories can be found at mica-edwards.com.
You can find more of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights newcomer Kevin Barberi and actress Melissa Medina right here on our very own network. On to the shows. Longtime resident and powerhouse Otis Jiry has his very own show here on our network, Scary Stories Told in the Dark, which you can hear every Sunday night. We also have Eric Peabody's Horror Hill, a podcast dedicated to some of our deeper and darker tales. We hope you check him out. And Drew Blood's Dark Tales airs Fridays, featuring some southern down-home horror. Now, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host of the evening, Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. <laughs> Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.